are two things my wife and I are insanely excited about this year. The first being the final season of Game of Thrones, and the second is Endgame. I honestly can't remember a time I was this excited to see a movie since The Return of the King after Peter Jackson gave us that exhausting epic battle of Helm's Deep in The Two Towers. The reason I'm so excited about this movie isn't just the incredible cliffhanger at the end of Infinity War, but it's because I fell in love with Thanos. And although I have started reading comic books in the last few years, I didn't know anything about Thanos going into Infinity War as I'm more of a DC Comics guy myself. Also, since I'm on the subject of great comic book villains, my personal favorite is Sinestro. Not just because I'm a Green Lantern fan, but because like Thanos in Infinity War, he has a ton of depth to him. And even after everything he's done, you can easily find yourself identifying with him and his cause. I'll throw a link down to the start of Jeff John's Green Lantern run. Trust me guys, it's a killer epic space opera akin to Star Wars or Star Trek. Go check it out. With that being said, I didn't feel like Thanos was the greatest villain I've ever seen or read about, but he had something to him, something special as I sat there just watching him move closer and closer to his goals that made me think about just how great he was for that story in particular and how his qualities and portrayal made him such a great dungeon master tool to study as a fantastic Dungeons and Dragons villain. There are of course several reasons why I think he fits the mold of a great D&D villain, but the biggest is the way he reshaped the protagonist's goals. They tried to have a physical showdown with him and that simply didn't work. Hulk failed, Thor failed, Loki failed, Star-Lord and the Guardians went to nowhere and failed when they tried to physically confront him. When he showed up in Wakanda, Black Panther failed, Captain America failed, Falcon failed, the Winter Soldier failed. All physical assaults on Thanos were completely useless, with even Thor's re-emergence with his new super weapon finally delivering a significant blow to Thanos, it ultimately failed to stop him. Because I find personally, one of the hardest things to do sometimes as a dungeon master is to create that villain tied to a complex goal that cannot be simply stabbed to death. As the old saying goes, if it has stats, it can be killed, right? I mean, and let's be honest, not all, but a good chunk of players default to, okay, let's kill him, murder hoboism. But by establishing the character early as being completely dominant of the Asgardians and completely unfazed by arguably the protagonist's strongest fighter in Hulk, it forced the goals for the Avengers to shift from trying to simply beat him down, to Gamora lying about the Soul Stone in order to prevent him from obtaining it, to trying to trick him into a mesmerized state to remove his gauntlet, to even attempting to delay him and sacrifice one of their own just to keep the Mind Stone out of his hands. But again, the Thanos type villain is a great template for us to use in our D&D campaigns beyond just being so powerful he can't be stabbed to death. So let's look at all of the characteristics the Russo brothers gave him that added to his depth in order to lay an outline for Dungeon Masters looking to incorporate a Thanos villain into their next campaign. But first, it's sponsor time. Gotta pay those bills. Huge shout out to today's sponsor, Deck of Many, with their new amazing Kickstarter, Humblewood. Humblewood is a campaign setting for 5e that includes new bird folk player races, new monsters, compelling adventures, and so much more. We've talked about it before here on the channel, but the Kickstarter is live right now, and this thing is blowing up, guys. I think at the time of recording this video, it was doing close to a quarter of a million dollars with the tons and tons and tons of uh, stretch goals being unlocked, and uh, I think they have three weeks to go. So there's gonna be a lot of really great goodies included in this Kickstarter. I'll throw a link down to it down below. Go check out Humblewood and jump in on that Kickstarter. You're not gonna wanna miss this one. Thank you, Deck of Many, for being a part of the Taking 20 team. One of the first things I absolutely loved about Thanos in the MCU is that his plan had started being put into motion regardless of where the heroes are in the story. This can work even better for us as Dungeon Masters for our villain than in film, as we can focus more on building a living, breathing world, particularly if we have campaigns that have already started at higher levels or if our campaign has been going on for a while now. A great example is the collection MacGuffin trope story arc. 
The story where you have to collect all the pieces of an ancient staff or a crystal or orb that will unlock unmeasured power or, you know, magic stones from across the universe. I'm sure we've all played in a game that uses this trope, and I have no problem with it just because it is a trope. But by having our villain already having collected three of the seven Dragon Balls before the PCs are even aware of what a Dragon Ball is, it not only creates urgency for our campaign, but brings plausibility to our story when we're trying to show the players that the world is living and breathing with multiple things happening that they aren't involved in. And it also subtly highlights that our villain is competent and capable of achieving their goals and shaping the world as much as the players do. So if the players don't like the way the villain is planning on reshaping the world, they better get involved and involved quick. Which leads me to my next point, Thanos is competent, very competent. And he can see all of the moving parts to get him to his next goal. He knows what he needs to do and once he's in motion, he acts with urgency. There is no hesitation or waiting for the Avengers to rest up and learn about what all they need to do next. He goes straight from one stone to the next stone, sending his allies to fetch the stones on Earth while he heads to nowhere to find the Collector. This can be a great tool to use regardless if your campaign is using the collection MacGuffin trope, that even if your PCs find victory over their nemesis or even over their nemesis cronies, the main villain isn't sitting back doing nothing. He's more than competent to be attacking on two fronts by engaging in what must be done by himself while simultaneously utilizing his forces to handle a completely different task. Just like Rob Stark outmaneuvering Tywin Lannister to capture Jaime, our villain might even risk a loss on one front by not handling it himself while he moves even closer to his ultimate goal in another area. Your players might stop the villain's crony from getting their four-star Dragon Ball, but meanwhile, the villain just picked up another two. This is something else I really loved about Thanos, and something to take note of here, guys. He has surrounded himself with powerful and competent allies. The only thing I was bummed about in Infinity War was just how little screen time the children of Thanos got, because the little that we did get to see them, they were incredibly formidable and competent on their own without being looked over by Thanos. But their character development was really only hinted at. Now, we don't necessarily need to have incredibly rich backgrounds for every trusted captain at the side of our villain, because ultimately, we want to use them as weapons for our villain against the PCs, but if you think spending a little time here or there to flesh them out a bit might add to your campaign, you can still keep it simple stupid. By using a collective of competent allies fighting alongside your big bad, it gives you extra tools to play with, including the why part of the equation, which I'll talk about here in a moment. But competent allies allows us to foreshadow to our players the incredible power level the big bad evil guy has, hinting that they will most likely lose any straight up fight with him. It also gives our murder hobo players something that they can fight. So if fighting the big bad is going to get them killed, at least they have something that they can swing a sword at. And of course, it allows the villain to achieve his goals faster if he can reliably spread his areas of attack, focusing on several checkpoints at once in order to secure his goals. Additionally, it just gives us more content. Whether you want to turn each of these allies into mini boss fights or not, Ultimately, the PCs will have to deal with them in one way or another. Just be sure to give your players the creative room to do so. If they believe three of the allies must be killed or imprisoned, but the fourth one is struggling with blindly following the main villain into their plan, and so she might be convinced to stand down or even join their cause against the big bad, just give them enough room for it as long as they approach it in a feasible way which is the last reason these competent allies used by a Thanos-type villain are so excellent, because you have room to play with as to the why they are each following him so vigorously. Maybe you don't think your villain is the type to break down his master plan or his motivation in a big monologue with the PCs when they finally confront him and all of my plans, but by having all of these allies, they can instead give snippets of what's to come or what the villain's plan is as the PCs confront them. When the merciful Xerxes takes the throne back from the usurper, you are the ones who will be judged. 
And just like that, with a simple line of dialogue from one of these allies, it can start to set a tone to a coherent plan being acted on by the Thanos-type villain. So, let's look at another angle here regarding the why and plans of Thanos and why I personally found him interesting. Of course, by now we all know his plan was to eliminate half of all life throughout the galaxy. Or, universe. Yeah, universe. This, of course, was thought of by Thanos as genuine mercy, protecting the universe from itself and its finite resources, and this was a much more interesting goal than the typical money and power motivations we get too often from villains trying to improve their station. You could say he was even driven into his grand mad plan by grief and even fear of the tragedy that hit his home planet of Titan happening to the rest of the universe as a motivator that I touched on in another video, link down below. But the key here is his goal, not the plan. His true goal is rather noble. He wants to make sure that there is enough resources for the universe to survive. He wants to make sure children don't go hungry. His goal is not to wipe out half the universe's population. That's his method, and that's what makes him a villain. But his goal of trying to fix the problem of too many mouths to feed is what makes him so identifiable for the audience and most likely why the children of Thanos are loyal to him. It's what separates him from Heath Ledger's Joker, another great villain in his own right. No one identifies with the Joker. No one is rooting for him. He's a great villain because we love to hate him. But Thanos has noble intentions, and the argument for some could be even that his methods justify the ends. As the saying goes, a good villain believes that they are right, but a great villain is right. And if we can learn from Thanos and give our campaign villains opportunities to plant that seed with our players that the villain's goals are in fact noble and not born out of a desire for power, even just that tiny seed of doubt, is enough to make them a memorable villain. A powerful necromancer turned lich who is traveling the land infecting and collecting powerful clerics, church figures, and alchemists into his horde is naturally a villain. But if his goals are to both punish the churches for focusing too much on opulence instead of coming to the aid of the northern villages when a terrible plague broke out, while simultaneously forcing them to endure the pains the plague caused his people in hopes that they might find a cure or die trying, it might be enough to just plant that tiny little seed of doubt with the players that, you know what, maybe he's right. After all, even if the players manage to finally stop the villain, that doesn't instantly solve all the world's problems with the plague going on. Which brings me to my next point, and an important lesson we can take away from Thanos. He never loses sight of his goal, even when the heroes present themselves as an obstacle. Even when the heroes come inches away from removing his gauntlet, and he learns that they most likely killed Ebony Maw, one of his children of Thanos, when he returns to Titan and finds Doctor Strange waiting for him instead of Ebony Maw, he doesn't want to kill the Avengers. He views himself as the hero of the story, only doing what he must do to be the hero. He could have easily killed all of the Avengers and Guardians in his battle on Titan and then mopped up the remaining heroes on Earth to claim the final stone, but he was easily swayed by Doctor Strange to let them live because killing them wasn't his goal. But the one key thing I want to point out for Dungeon Masters here that are looking to draw inspiration for a Thanos-type villain in their next campaign, if you want to have your big mad be so powerful that they wipe the board with the players while fanatically being obsessed with the ultimate goals and they decide to let the players live, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you take note of this Thanos interaction on just one specific thing. Just because Thanos let them live and completely dominated the heroes on Titan doesn't mean he was dismissive of them. Thanos never once taunted Tony and Strange because he also saw them as heroes. Just because he felt like he was doing what was best for the universe doesn't mean that he thought of himself as being better or superior. He was doing what he thought must be done, nothing more, nothing less. 
And not to get too political here, but you can see the stark contrast between doing what you think is best for everyone, even though other people disagree, but still respecting them for wanting similar goals, even though you obviously disagree on how to get there and achieve those goals. Thanos saw Tony as a hero trying to protect the people he loved. Thanos just thought he knew better than Tony in actually how to protect people because of his experience with loss of his homeworld. But going on Twitter and to name call and degrade people you are at odds with just because you disagree with the methods, even though the goals are supposed to be the same thing, is what I would avoid when and if your villain ends up confronting the party physically. So I'd highly recommend to take note of this and avoid taunting the players, especially if the big bad won soundly against them and you are still trying to plant those little seeds of doubt. And finally, the last takeaway I have for the Thanos type villain being used in Dungeons and Dragons is that he had both personality and he showed remorse. Much like choosing not to taunt the Avengers after soundly beating them, Thanos viewing himself as the hero on a noble but daunting quest is actually capable of sorrow. And in his first confrontation with Star-Lord, he even tells his possible future son-in-law that he likes him. For Dungeon Masters, playing up this personality can be difficult but not impossible. My advice is to hint at other interactions that break the mold with the angry world conqueror archetype and show that your villain is capable of compassion. Maybe your players learn of them actually committing a deed that some people might consider being heroic. Maybe they traveled through an area and while they were at an inn, they stopped a drunkard brute from assaulting a barmaid. Or maybe they helped a tavern keeper and broke up a bar fight and helped them actually pay for some of the repairs. Maybe they shared in the merriment and joined a busking bard for a few songs only to allow them to keep all the earnings for themselves, or they delivered medicine to a local healer for her to use on the sickly children. As the players learn of all of these things, it will begin to create a more complex outlook on the villain as they try to stop him from ultimately accomplishing his goals. Goals for which the players will hopefully have to circumvent with a plan and strategy of their own that goes beyond being able to simply cast spells at him and trying to, you know, stab him to death. So what do you guys think about the Thanos type villain being used in a Dungeons and Dragons campaign? Do you have any great story seats for a powerful villain that cannot be simply beaten up? And how do you feel about a CR 15 or CR 20 main villain campaign being used against a party of say, level five or six adventures. Is that fair? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I of course want to give a hearty thank you to all the amazing patrons over at welcomeadventures.com. Guys, it's because of you that I can keep doing this job without you, it will go away. And so for that, I am just so grateful. If you guys like what I do here and you want to support the channel while picking up some extra swag for yourself, welcomeadventures.com is a great place to do that. If this is your first time here and you love role-playing games as much as I do, I'd love to have you subscribe. Every week I put out new videos on GM tips, player tips, tutorials, and more. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, just hit the subscribe button down below and come join us. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Cody and may your games be filled with awesome memories and even better friends. I'll catch you guys next time. Yeah.